Welcome to the Apostolic Center Podcast. Um, good to be back this year. We took off the holidays. Um, we're starting off the year with a good podcast, though, with Brother Shelton. Thank you for being with us. What an honor. We're here for 217. Um, and then you'll be back again for Faith Revival in mid-February. So we'll probably do another podcast. But since we're a little limited on time, I kind of just want to jump in, if that's okay. Sure. Um, today, during your session, you talked a little bit about offenses. You, you kind of touched on it briefly you know i, I kind of want to go two ways about this um because there's some people who get offended while going through trials you know waiting to hear from god and there's some people who just get offended at everything and everyone um can you kind of talk about going through trials the purposes of trials and how to not get offended going through those when it's easy to do that well Like I said, I guess this morning, the purpose of a trial. First of all, I think we have to believe if we're going to be able to endure it and survive it, we really have to believe Scripture mm -hmm. that all things work together. If I believe that, and if I believe He is the Father that He says He is, <clears throat> then I may not like what I'm going through, but I can endure it without being offended and mad and getting bitter over it. That don't mean that you're not going to lay awake at night. That don't mean that, you know, if it's, if it's to do with a child, sickness with a child, which is one of my big deals. I, I, can, I can deal with a lot for me, but when it's my kids, that don't make sense to me. Uh, and, and it doesn't really matter what the trial is. If I understand and believe, it's not just about understanding, it's about being convinced that being the kind of father he is, if this didn't serve some positive purpose in the kingdom, I wouldn't be going through it. It wouldn't be happening. So, you know, it makes it bearable. Mm -hmm. Some things are unbearable because we don't believe they have a kingdom purpose. Now, offended is not the same thing as being mad, being angry. <laughs> the scripture, in fact, says be angry, but stop short of sin, mm -hmm. which in my opinion would be where offense started because an offense is where I start holding a grudge and I start, uh, as scripture says, charging God foolishly and blaming all of this on him from the vantage point and the perspective that he doesn't care about me. Offense comes when I reach that point in my thinking about what I'm going through, that God's doing this to me, God doesn't care, God's not aware, and God hates me, and which lends itself to the whole other conversation about the power of our verbiage. There are times that I've been through things that were crushing seasons of heaviness and not not depression just i'm done i'm exhausted i don't care i don't want to do anything else i'm don't prophesy to me don't because it seems like every time somebody prophesies it gets worse okay and i have to accept that it's there for a purpose you know, sometimes those those things are there to to derail us, not from his agenda, but from ours, because we've jumped the track somewhere and got on our own agenda, and we've got our own game plan, and that's not what he had in plan for us. So, again, I guess I could go all over the county talking about it, but at the end of the day, I think it comes down to if I really do believe that all things work together for the good of them, if I really believe Scripture, then those verses give me peace. And I know that even though I don't understand it, and even though I don't like it, and I've got a 100,000 questions, what I do know is that by and by, somewhere in eternity, if nowhere else, in eternity, I'll understand it. But from here, to eternity, I've got to trust him. Mm -hmm. I've said this a lot of times too. Faith is what makes us take God's hand. Trust is what keeps us from letting it go. 
Faith can move mountains, but it don't always. Faith can, but it doesn't always. And there comes a point where our faith has been tested and tried, and it hadn't changed anything to the degree we want it changed. Right. At that point, it's just take a tighter grip on that hand and hold on. Some things he takes us and delivers us from it. Some things he delivers us through. And when he decides, I'm going to deliver you through this, I have to believe that that's exactly what he's going to do. And again, it's like I said today, you know, my knee, my ankles, I, I, I am exhausted. I hurt all the time. Now, that may lift, and I may go six months or a year and not have hardly any pain. But right now, for the last two years, every step, every single step has hurt. Sleeping at night, can't hardly do it. I don't understand all that. But we're in good company because Christ himself hanging on a cross, his last interaction with the Father was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mm. And sometimes in trials we do feel forsaken. But it's all for the purpose of the kingdom and for him to show himself powerful and mighty and to do in us a great work. And it comes down to, if I'm not going to get offended, I'm going to have to trust him. That's the only way I know to avoid offense in, in those settings of trials and tribulations and tests. If I don't trust him, if I don't trust him, I'm going to tell you right this minute what's going to happen next. I'm going to get offended. Mm-hmm. Not I'm not talking about anybody else. Me, this guy, I'm going to get mad. Yeah, and you kind of brought it up, too, with the bitterness part of it, which is why I wanted to bring up, because a lot of people go through trials and situations, and they forget that, you know, once they get offended, it leads to bitterness, and then it can lead to unforgiveness, but it doesn't only affect them, but it affects those that are around them, their That's husband, right. their wife, their their kids. Yeah, so I think it's an important topic um, to touch on, because people don't think about how their emotions and their spirit affects their family. Um, you know, have you seen that throughout your, your years of people gone through trials and it didn't go through it the right way or oh, yeah. destroy their family? Oh, yeah. I don't know one person, Brother Jensen and I have talked about this various times, I don't know one person that has done what we call backslidden that wasn't offended first, Mm -hmm. not one. And I don't care if it's they were offended with the greeters at the front door or, but ultimately our, our grievances are not toward a person. They may be focused there and it may manifest itself, but most, most of us, our offenses are we're offended at God over something. And now we lash out or take it out on whoever else, but our ultimate offense is at him. He made me go through something nobody else went through. Well, I may not know it, but a hundred other people may have gone through that same thing or worse. But when you're in something, nobody else is. Mm -hmm. In your brain, it looks like everybody else's world is perfect. Right. And the mess you're going through is all you can see. It's all of a sudden you've got blinders. and You can't see anything. All you can see is what's right in front of you the, the quagmire of just whatever it is. I can't see the end of this. And I think sometimes God blinds us to that too. But yes, if if we don't go through it correctly, it's going to absolutely affect everybody around us. There's just no question. For someone going through something like this, you know, what kind of advice would you give of protections to protect themselves during this time? Submit to your accountability. You're a pastor. Stay accountable. Have I, I, and it's not original with me. I heard somebody say it before I said it, but we all need a Paul, Silas, and a Timothy. We need that Paul to be accountable to. We need a Silas in our life that we can share stuff with um, for accountability, but <clears throat> uh, iron sharpeneth iron. And if I'm sharing what I'm going through with someone, then the load's a little easier to carry. 
And then you've got somebody in your life that you're given to all the time that keeps you from just getting stuck in that situation. Mm. It's hard to give when you don't want to. Because it feels like I need everything I can get to survive this. But the truth of it is, if there's not a continual flow, we get stagnant. And then we die. Or have to start all over from ground zero. I think if we can keep being accountable and, and being given instructions from somebody above us, sharing this stuff with somebody adjacent to us and mm-hmm. then pouring into somebody that's coming along after us. Uh, it keeps that flow of anointing and that flow of the spirit keeps you fresh and refreshed and doesn't allow things to get stuck in here and, and take on a bitter role. You know, parents with kids, we fix a lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches when we don't want to. Mm. And getting off that couch keeps your blood circulating. Uh, you don't have to worry <laughs> about a blood clot in your ankle because <laughs> you got kids to feed. Right. And kids will keep you from laying in bed getting depressed. You walk around and be depressed. <laughs> <laughs> but when you've got somebody that you're feeding spiritually, it, mm-hmm. it doesn't, it prevents you from just getting stuck over here and whatever you're going through. That's good. Yeah. Um, I like what you said today about um, with struggles, it, it's getting you ready for the next season of life. God's preparing you. And I think you have to make sure you have the right perspective. Um, at Apostolic Center, we've heard a lot of um, preaching about perspective lately. And if you can get it in your mind that this is getting me ready, this is growing me, instead of falling into poor me, you know, that's what our flesh, I know I like getting sympathy. <laughs> Nothing gets me crying <laughs> faster than sympathy. I'm a sympathy crier. I'm not proud of it, but um, but if we can get our perspective changed, yes. you know, it can carry us through. You know, uh, that word, you've said it two or three times there, perspective, it's everything. Mm. When Gehazi comes back and tells Elijah, or Elisha, whichever one it was, he said, uh, brother, we, we hemmed in on every side. Now, he prayed for God to do two miracles. One, uh, do a miracle in his sight so he can see. And then blind these people around us so they don't know who we are. Why didn't he just pray that one? Why didn't he just pray, strike them with blindness, camouflage us so they don't know who we are? Why did he want Gehazi to see that? It made more sense. Gehazi quit griping. When he realized, you know what? There's we got help beyond this. I know how bad it looks to my natural eye, but this spiritual perspective, we're not in this alone. Mm-hmm. Well, what if what if the next time Gehazi was trapped, hemmed in, and all he had had that first time around was just God did a miracle and blinded them? What if what if the prophet's not there the next time? Right. He's had a perspective change. Mm-hmm. He can see something now that he couldn't see before. And I do think that perspective is everything. Because if if you can't if you can't see something for what it is, it becomes everything that your mind can imagine. You're gonna see it one way or the other, mm-hmm. in the spirit or mentally. Mm-hmm. And if your brain starts drawing pictures, I don't know about everybody else's, but my brain <laughs> when my brain starts drawing a picture, it's worst case scenarios. Yeah. Every hypothetical thing you can imagine right here, I, I can produce it. Well, then, guess what? Because you haven't got, Brother Barnes said we had to pray for five miracles every day. A miracle in the mind, a miracle in our eyes, a miracle in our hearing, our heart, and our emotions. And if we don't if we don't get this thing, a miracle in our head on a daily basis, mm-hmm. I can't speak for y'all, but I'm just telling you, my brain can run away with me. It ain't good. So perspectives, everything. Right. Yeah, I kind of want to switch over to another topic um, along this lines, though. Um, 
you've talked about brokenness a lot of the times that you've been here. Can you kind of, I don't think we've ever recorded it. Can you kind of give me your perspective on brokenness and kind of your thoughts on that? Being it's broken. Beautiful. It's brutal, but it's beautiful. We are image conscious. He's identity conscious. He is, we're trying to present an image to the world that makes us look attractive to them is what we say. The truth of it is, we're not trying to look better for everybody else. We're not trying to look a certain way, present ourselves, be so good at what we do to impress them. The truth of it is, we're doing all this stuff to impress ourselves mm. because we hate the fact that we are but dust. The scripture says, he remembereth our frame that it is but dust, and we don't like it. Flesh don't like that characterization. I'm better than that. I'm, well, no, not really. <laughs> we just dirt. All right. And <clears throat> in all of his earthly ministry, he did tremendous miracles. The greatest one he did, though, he did from the most broken position he had ever been in. So broken, his own mother wouldn't have recognized him had she not been there to witness his brutalization. Brokenness is where we finally look like him. Everything else does not look like him. But brokenness, we look just like him. And then in that place of brokenness, when the spirit flowed out of him, the veil in the temple was rent, the graves gave up the dead saints, on it the sky was darkened, we are only able to release the flow of the Spirit like we should to a broken vessel. We worry about the position of the vessel. He wants us to worry about the condition of the vessel. And the condition that he wants the vessel in is brokenness. So he leaves us things in our life that assist us in that endeavor, staying broken. I'm going to leave you this. Throw yourself on it. And if you don't, I love you so much, and I want you to look like me so bad, I'm going to let this roll over on you and crush you. Mm -hmm. and so there are times, some of these trials we're talking about a while ago, some of them are nothing more than that thing I should have fallen on having to roll over on me. And it produces a brokenness that only God can. And in that position of brokenness, then, you finally realize this is where the true anointing is. This, this is how I get more from how do you get more God? Brokenness. The more places something can flow in, the more you can take in. And then the more places it can flow out, the greater the volume is that flows through you. I mean, that's it yeah. in a nutshell. You know, it's 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 necessary. Yeah, and that's the thing about trials sometimes. It doesn't always look like we're accomplishing something during that time, but you know, when you look back five years later, ten years later. You can really see, wow, look what God, look how I grew, look how he changed me. I talk a lot about this with marriage. Um, a lot of times we have a, you know, we're a now society, give me it now, two-day Amazon shipping, uh, fast food. But it's not about how are we today, but how are we in a year? How's our yeah. marriage in 10 years, 20 years? Um, because that's the real test right there. A lot of, a lot of times we want to change everything now. Well, it's not going to happen. No, that's what sanctification is for. It's it's a lifetime of God working on us. Um, He's playing the long game. Exactly. And that's what I've had to learn as I've gotten older. You know, in my 20s, you want everything to happen now, but it's how am I going to look hopefully 60, you know, 30, 40 years from now, you know. Um, but our perspective sometimes isn't isn't that. No. It's 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 I want this problem to be solved quickly. Um, and I guess a lot of times we take the personal growth out of it. Um, those trials are to help you and to, yes. to shape you. Um, so hopefully, you know, this is encouraging to someone out there going through something that, you know, you might not see it now. But you will. But you will. I like the analogy that you've used in the past about the mosaic. Mm -hmm. um, do you care to share that? I know that helped me. Yeah. Our, our lives are are a accumulation of pieces. We want a solid piece. We want <laughs> one piece. But he says, can't do that. Hmm. You don't look like me put together. I need you broken apart. The artist 
He'll have piles of it everywhere in his studio. In his mind, he knows what's going on that wall. Nobody else does. And it doesn't matter how much he tries to explain it, who he tries to tell it to. When you're looking at it and you're thinking of it in terms of, I'm going to paint something. Okay, fine. I can see that. But you're talking about multiple piles of rubbish that don't go together. And you're, you're telling me you're going to present this on this wall? It's not possible. And one of the guys that I read an article by said that he had gone and sat in uh, museums and watched these people come through these galleries looking at mosaics. And he said that he noticed one of the ones, the ones that they stayed in front of the longest were the ones who had the most broken pieces and the smallest pieces. And a lot of times we think, I'm as far as I can go. There's, I'm, how, how much more broken can I get? Right. And the master says, uh, one more. Mm. And he throws that down onto the ground. And if he has to, he'll put his foot on you and grind you to dust to get one grain and put it in that final location. And the people that were the most mesmerized by these mosaics said, we, it's just, it's astounding that the artist knew how to put that one little bitty piece. If that wasn't in there, this whole picture goes away. And um, in Northern Africa, during a lot of the wars they had there, a lot of buildings would be obliterated. But they found there would be just random walls standing out in the middle of these little villages and towns. And when they went around on the back side of them, there was a mosaic there. And all of that brokenness was put together with additional mortar that made the wall it was put on stronger. And that wall was able to withstand the horrific nature of war. And where everything else was destroyed, that wall survived wow. because of all those broken pieces held together by that mortar on the backside. And the things in our life, Paul said, in my weakness, he's made strong. In, in our lives, the areas of our life that we feel the weakest really are the strongest because that's where he's holding you together. That's where he's got all the pieces put. He's got them where he wants them, and he's holding that where it's supposed to be. And it doesn't matter what the enemy says. It don't matter how bad it feels or what your brain tells you. This is where he's going to shine. This is where God's not going to leave me or forsake me. This is where he'll never fail me. Here's where I'm vulnerable. Here's where I need him. Here's where I'm exposed. Here's where he'll be. And so all of a sudden, your life becomes this priceless mosaic. And when your friends come along that remember when mm -hmm. you went through that and you went through that and you went through that, and they look at that now and they're like, how in the world? Our response is simply, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I would say, broken, hot mess, and he put all this here. I didn't do any of this. God did it. And again, you know, it's like it, it, it prospers us in the realm of trust. We are so blessed and enriched to be able to trust him at a level we couldn't before this happened or before I went through that season or whatever. And so everything that we see as rubbish, he sees as something priceless. To him, that's part of a greater picture. That Have you ever made the statement to somebody that you were talking to and you said, do you see what I'm saying? We rarely can see what he's saying, so he just shows us. He builds and sculpts, and when it's over with, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to fuss no more. Mm. I'm going to hang on. But then the next season of storms, our natural go-to response is panic. He's like, hey, when you get through, I'll be right here. Mm -hmm. I'll do it again. Yeah. That's awesome. Um I kind of want to ask you a question. So you're, you go around to a lot of churches, you evangelize. If there's one thing about the modern day church you could change, what would it be? Trying to have something for nothing. Hmm. We were actually talking about that on the way over here today. During, like, through World War II, the Depression, prior to that, the industrialization of this country 
Mm-hmm. We, were, we were a people, and the world is a whole. We worked. People, everybody had a hard job. Everybody had a hard life. Church was the easy side of life. Coming to the house of God with or without air conditioning, with or without heat, that at least nobody was breaking their back, chopping wood, digging coal, plowing, picking cotton, etc. And people came to the house of God like in the summertime, and they, they were still sweated down because half of them walked to church. You walk in the building and or the brush harbor or the tent or whatever, and everybody had B.O. Everybody <laughs> was dripping with sweat. Everybody was a mess. The mosquitoes were biting everybody, but they wanted something from God so bad, working to get it was not a foreign concept. We've been working all day. What's this? Mm. This is no big deal. People studied to show thyself approved, what Scripture says. Nowadays, Brother Jensen's mentioned this this weekend, but we now have AI. You're going to produce a paper? You want to produce a sermon? Just tell AI, hey, print me out a thousand-word sermon on this topic. Bam. I don't even know how to do it, but it, from all I understand, in just 10 seconds, you, you've got some there, and you can just go read the fire out of that. It'll cost you nothing. That means it's going to profit you nothing. And you're going to give it to people, and they're going to benefit minimally. From what you just delivered to them. And I think we have lost our work ethic in the church. And, you know, if you're doing a math problem, and I made this analogy in the car to Brother Jensen a while ago, if you're doing a math problem and you get a calculator out to do the math problem, you're going to get a good score on your test because you figured all the math out. And they said, use your calculator. Mm -hmm. You're going to be an engineer. You're going to be using these things. Use it. So who really should get the credit? Me, because I knew what buttons to punch and I knew a formula Mm -hmm. or the person who figured all that out and put it in that calculator to make my job easier. And I think we've come to a point in the church where we just, we know how to come in and push buttons. We know what buttons make people run the aisles, what buttons make people cry, what buttons make people leap for joy, what buttons make people want to repent. And and we've learned it because we've watched elder after elder after elder do it. So I'll just preach like they do. I'll get the same response that they get. I'll tailor it a little bit to meet my personality, but I'm just going to reproduce what I've seen somebody doing. And we've lost, we have lost the results of, uh, I don't even know how to say it, but like originality in the body of Christ. It's, it's nobody is uniquely their own anymore. Everybody. We're so exposed to everything technologically that we can watch enough. And if you watch somebody's delivery enough, you're going to get that in your spirit and it's coming out one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Uh, even without you intending it to or even wanting it to, it's coming out. And I think that's the thing that, and it's like you said too, it's like we want it now. Well, I prayed three hours last week. Well, that's wonderful. Thank God. But what what's that all about? You prayed three hours and you want what in return? What about the guy that prays three years before God responds? And so to me, I, I see that. I see a spirit of indifference. I, I've, I'm i telling you right now, probably being way too transparent. <laughs> I would just as soon sit at the house and count blades of grass in my yard in August with no water or a hat to wear in the sun on my hands and knees, hungry, fighting off buzzards and ants, <laughs> counting that grass, than to spend five minutes sharing passion, revelation, with somebody that just doesn't care. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
and it's it's a it's a challenge sometimes because you stand in pulpits and you look out there and you see people that you got one group that's starving they would they will receive everything God's got for them. You got this other group over here that your humanity can't stop looking at. Yeah. They don't care. You just hurry up, I can go eat. Mm. So I th- I think those probably are the two things yeah. that I I wish we could we could get a grasp of and change them. Go back to work in the kingdom. And and either be passionate chat in the foyer. <laughs> what do you think causes that indifference in people? Are they just there for the a social? lack of conviction, a lack of the spirit of the fear of the Lord. You know, when you look at the seven spirits of God, one of them is the spirit of the fear of the Lord, in Isaiah. And, and there's just no fear of God seems like among us. Not say that I shouldn't. That's a little closed minded, but. There is a diminished amount of the spirit of the fear of the Lord in the body of Christ. And, you know, I think a lot about Job. The spirit of wisdom comes to Job, which is another one of the seven spirits of God. And the spirit of wisdom asks Job, who are you? Question him. Hmm. Were you there in the beginning when the foundations of the earth were laid? No. Well, I was. You need to hush your mouth. So I, I don't know. I, I think there's a, again, there's been, we, are, we are diminished in our awe of God. We're not awestruck by him anymore. The world can reproduce everything we can produce. Mm-hmm. Speaking in tongues, they talk in tongues. They can baptize like we do. Everything we do, they can do. Nobody can duplicate anybody else's relationship with God and walk with God. But I think we've become, you know, and, and and he and I were talking today, but it's like we are, we have, we've become somewhat seduced and deluded mm-hmm. because we can have all of this stuff without any of the effort. Right. And, the church is not a democracy. It's a theocracy. And I said it today, but our opinions are just not that important. Our surrender is what's important. Right. And so I guess I, I've rattled on here, but I think sometimes the, the biggest block is iniquity. My will. Yeah. yeah. My will. I want it my way right here, right now. We're Burger King. And the Lord's not going to do it. He said no flesh would glory in his presence. So if I don't come to him with full surrender, I, I have no right to expect anything from him except conviction. Right. Yeah, sometimes I see that indifference too from uh, people whose family has been in the church a long time. You know, you, you kind of get to that place where you're living off your parents' commitment and dedication. Yes. Well, you know, when when... The Brush Harbor days, the latter rain days, they they had to pray and fast and intercede for survival. Right. Well, then the next generation learned how to emulate all of that effort for desires. Now we live in a generation where our needs are met, our desires are available. We have the ability and the capacity to obtain those things without him. So I'll... I'll just do that. And if I can have what I want in my life without having to go to him to get it, it's easier to go do it my way because here I don't have to be broken. Here I don't have to be submitted to the will of God. Here I don't have to surrender my will. I can do what I want to do. Right. And I don't, I could have it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. That's a voluntary effort. I have to put his kingdom first. What if I don't want to put his kingdom first? I may, I may ultimately end up with what I'm trying to obtain, but it's not going to be when I want it. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. I think, I think our ability to have what we want without him 
has messed us up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to want to kind of talk about marriages. Um, how long have you been married? Forever. <laughs> <laughs> good good answer. Um, you know, it seems like our marriage marriages have always been under attack, but I feel like it's you know obviously ramped up probably in the last 40, 50 years. You know, do you see any of that in your ministry or? Yeah. Brother Wright has helped me in in many times, and he's talked to my wife and I. Mm-hmm. Don't don't create two different worlds in your marriage. Mm-hmm. One world. Now, we have two different functions, and oftentimes a wife will have not because we we've said the wife does X. I'm just saying the natural, the way things just fall in every home is different. Mm-hmm. Um, so if if a wife is, let's say a man is a preacher and he travels, mm-hmm. she don't travel with him. She's going to be at home with the kids. He's out here doing what he's doing, traveling, preaching, doing whatever, like it is with my wife and I. When we had no children, she went with me everywhere. Can't do that now with a house full of kids. Mm-hmm. So I have to go do what I do and realize that when I get home, I have to be who I am. Maybe a man of God, but at home, I'm just a man. I'm just Scott. I, I'm, I'm daddy. And I think it takes a conscious effort, you know, for us to realize I'm doing what I'm doing as service to the kingdom as a preacher, as a stay-at-home mom, I couldn't do. My wife, and, and that's another thing, we don't value each other's role like we should. Yep, that's good. I could not do what I do if it wasn't for Jennifer. I, right. I just couldn't. I'm going to tell you right now, put me in a paper sack and send me back to the house. I can't do this without her. Mm-hmm. I know my kids are learning to worship. You know how they learn to worship? Because their mother's teaching them. I can preach about it to everybody else. But my wife is teaching my children how to be and do what we are because they're not with me most of the time. Well, if I come home and think I'm the only one working here, that first of all, that's a lie. Right. right. The enemy lied. Secondly, if I come home and have that attitude, I've just demeaned her, mm-hmm. made her feel unimportant. The scripture and, and men... We're just, we're dumb as a box of rocks. But scripture says a wise woman does what? Buildeth up her house. Mm -hmm. Well, what kind of a man don't build up his house? If it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander kind of a deal. Right. If if the Lord says a good woman's going to build her house up, well, if I'm going to be a good man, shouldn't I be doing the same thing? Why do I have to have an entire verse dedicated to just tell me, hey, you too? Right. If yeah. I see that that qualifies her as good in his eyes, why wouldn't I do it? Right. What, my arms broke? I can do the laundry. I do the laundry. I'm constantly doing laundry. My God, I do more laundry than any five people I know. <laughs> <laughs> I asked my wife the other day, I said, how in the name of God are they getting this much stuff dirty? Yeah. They each have their own laundry basket. Mm-hmm. Bring your stuff down. Here they come down carrying a half a mountain with them. Where in the wide world all that geek? We just did this three days ago. Yeah. I just quit asking questions. Yep. Let's just go do laundry. And so I, I think it's just you have to be very careful not to have two worlds. That's one good. One world. We have different functions in it, but we have one world. We live in this one world together. That's like having two houses. All right, I'm going to buy a duplex instead of a house. I'm going to go buy a duplex. You live on your side, and I'll live over here. Right. You can't do that. You cannot compartmentalize marriage. It's whole hog or none. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and your marriage, have you and your wife had like, you know, from the beginning, like, hey, this is what we're going to do or key agreements or anything like that? You know what I'm saying? Like philosophy, philosophies to live by or rules. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is how we're going to do things. Yeah. There there have been things that uh, we, we sat down and discussed, okay, this is, what's mm-hmm. our position going to be on this? Yeah. Um, but then there's other things that I, as a husband and a dad, have had to say, we're not doing this, or we are going to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, now, that being the case, I'm gone a lot. I hate that part of it, but I am. So when I come home, 
I've got enough sense to ask her when the kids come and ask me, Daddy, can I do this? Daddy, can I? No, uh -uh. <laughs> no, we're not doing that. Yeah. I, where's, where's my wife at? <laughs> mm -hmm. And there are a lot of rules and guidelines that my kids have that I didn't set. She set them. Now, I can come in from being gone two days here and three days there and look at that and think, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard of. What What's wrong with me? I'm not there every day. Right. Mm -hmm. She carries the bulk of that responsibility, and if that rule helps her do her job and have more people, it's fine with me. Mm -hmm. If it ain't contradicting Scripture right. and, and causing any kind of a issue in our home, I'm not, I'm not going to question it or, or, or bypass it. I'm going to support it whole hog. And so we work together. You know, there's things that she'll say, I'm not comfortable with this. Fine. I, I trust her. I say all the time, the voice of God and the voice of your pastor sounds just alike. And a lot of times, the voice of God and the voice of your wife sounds identical. <laughs> and it's an idiot that don't believe that. <laughs> So are you an idiot? No, <laughs> no, no, no. That brother believes every bit of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're coming up on our time. So, um, like I said, we'll do this again in mid-February. Really appreciate you being on doing this it's with been us. It's an honor. I've um, enjoyed it. Have you been doing your own? I've seen you post a couple things. No. I'm still just doing the Tuesday nights with Brother Bourne okay. uh, every week. Uh, Brother Jensen and I have yeah, actually, you know what? Old. I forgot to send you guys that stuff. Yeah, Erickson, we need. Let's get a yeah. Let's get a list together because it's a pretty easy setup. So that, I, that'd be awesome I, if you guys start I doing that. I can't imagine somebody wanting to hear. I'm gonna just farm it out to Brother Jensen. Yeah, and yeah, he can. He can do it. He's, He's real techy. Okay, but yeah. Hey, thanks for being with us. We'll do this again in February. Yes, so, sir. Um, thanks for listening to the podcast. Please comment and subscribe and share. God bless. Mm -hmm.